Momentum It's something you've probably heard about before in numerous circumstances. There's a football team's momentum during a game. Can they carry their momentum into the fourth quarter, a sports reporter would say. But then there's also the physical sense where, let's say, you've got one of those football players in the game charging at you and you think, whoa, he's got a lot of momentum. So in the physical sense, momentum is a measure of how hard it is to stop something. Or more importantly for you, how much you want to get out of the way. There are two kinds of momentum. There is linear momentum, which as the name implies, is the momentum of objects traveling in a straight line. Then, there is angular momentum, which as also the name implies, is the momentum of rotating objects, like an ice skater. Let's first start with linear momentum, denoted P. Probably because they don't want to confuse it with mass, you know, if it was named M. So P, the linear momentum, is equal to mass times velocity. And this kind of makes sense by your intuition, right? A big object going really fast has a lot of momentum. And you really want to get out of the way of that one. Like that cheetah right there. Now, notice that linear momentum and velocity have little arrows over them. This signifies that they are vector quantities meaning that they have a magnitude and a direction, let's say x, y, z, north, south. It depends on the coordinate system you choose. Now let's use what we've learned to experimentally determine the linear momentum of three swimmers coming into a turn. I happen to be a swimmer myself, so I wanted to use my knowledge of momentum to see which one of my swimming friends can best use their linear momentum coming into the wall to flip the fastest and have the highest angular velocity. As an exercise, we'll also calculate their angular momentum. For comparison, I chose three swimmers of different masses. A big guy, a medium guy, and me, a small guy. From this experiment, I really wanted to prove that small swimmers can be good at swimming too. Or at least at the flip. Now to find the swimmer's linear velocities, I used a software that plotted points on the swimmers and calculated the displacement in each time interval, which, as we know, gives us the velocity. So after asking my friends to swim into the wall about 10 times, I calculated their linear momenta in an Excel sheet by multiplying their linear velocities by their masses. Now, let's calculate their angular momenta during the flip. Remember that ice skater? Even though the velocity of her center of mass is zero, since she's rotating about a single axis, she still has a momentum. It's just angular momentum this time. The same is true for the swimmer flipping at the wall. During the flip, the swimmer now has angular momentum rather than linear momentum. To introduce the concept of angular momentum, let's first start with the simplest case, the angular momentum of a single particle rotating with respect to an origin. The angular momentum of that particle is denoted L, as you can see by the cursor, my cursor on the screen, and it is a vector quantity that is the cross product of the radius r with its instantaneous linear momentum p, or mv. In order to understand what this kind of angular momentum is, let's first go over the mathematical definition of what a cross product is. The cross product is an operation on two vectors that results in another vector which is perpendicular to both of the vectors being multiplied and normal, that is perpendicular, to the plane containing them. In order to help remember the direction of the vector cross product, you can use the right hand rule as depicted here, where you put one finger along the direction of the first vector, another along the direction of the other, and then your thumb points in the direction of the resultant vector. Let's use what we know now to calculate the angular momentum of a particle orbiting within a radius r with the velocity v in the coordinate system shown there. As we know, the angular momentum of the particle is the dot product of the radius times its mass and velocity, and we're assuming that the radius of the, of the orbit is much greater than the radius of the particle, so we can think of it as a single distinct particle. That means that if the particle's mass is one kilogram, its radius of orbit is one meter, and it's going at one meters per second, that means that the angular momentum is one kilogram meter squared per second in the z-hat direction, and you can use the right-hand rule to check yourself. Now, let's do a little math to write our equation in a little different way, which I swear will be helpful later. So, from before, L equals the cross product between R and MV, which, if I take the mass out, is M times the cross product of M, R and V, and then if I multiply and divide, and divide by r squared on both sides, I get mr squared times the cross product of r and v over r squared, which equals this mysterious quantity i omega, where omega is the angular velocity and i is the moment of inertia. 
which is mr squared for a single particle rotating about an origin. So why futz around with this equation? The key point here is that the new form of the equation separates magnitude with i and change in angular direction with omega. i is in units of mass times length squared, as you can see, and it is a property of the object and its distance from an axis, whereas omega is uh, in units of angle or radians over time, which is a property of how fast the object is rotating. This form of the equation is now helpful when we calculate the angular momentum of an object of an arbitrary shape rotating about an axis. You can think of that object as a collection of lots and lots of little particles. Intuitively enough, the moment of inertia of that object rotating is actually just simply the sum of all the momenta of the little particles rotating about that axis. Interestingly, the moment of inertia of the object is dependent on the geometry of the object and the axis upon which it's rotating which as you can see here, all those different objects have different moment inertia depending on their shape and the axis of which they're rotating upon. You can also see that here, for the same shape, it has different moment of inertia depending on the axis, making it easier or harder to rotate. With all this in mind, we can now start calculating the angular momenta of the swimmers during the turn. I used the software again to follow points on the swimmer during the turn and determine their angular velocities. Now all we need is a suitable shape to model the swimmers during the turn to find their moment of inertia. How about this? It's called a half torus. It's not perfect, but for the purpose of my calculations, it'll do. Even better, some smart guy already calculated the moment of inertia of a half torus for me. For a half torus rotating about the z-axis, its moment of inertia is m, the mass, times 4 big r squared, the radius of the rotation, plus 3 little r squared, that is the radius of the actual torus itself, all over 4. Going back to the swimmer, I've marked little r and big r, where big r is the radius of the rotation and little r is the radius of the swimmer's torso. Okay, so now I have their masses, their big r, their little r, and their moment of inertia. Again, in an Excel sheet, I calculated their angular momentum by simply multiplying their moment of inertia by their angular velocity. So that's pretty cool. We've actually been able to calculate their angular momenta. So going back to that burning question, which swimmer is most efficient in converting their linear momentum into the wall into angular velocity during the flip? As you can see on the graph, the red dots, that is me, the small swimmer, is best at converting my smaller amounts of linear momentum into higher amounts of angular velocity because I can best tuck in, reduce my radius, and flip really fast during the turn. So, if we've learned anything from today's lesson, it's that short people dominate. Thanks for watching.